fabulous. Thanks, everyone. Well, good morning. Uh, my name's Danielle, and I'm the Education Coordinator here at Sydney Olympic Park. I'd like to welcome you all to the Youth Eco Summit 2014. Um, this morning, in the audience, uh, we've got Ebbing Boys High School, Cherrybrook Technology High School, Kingswood High School, and Rosebank Secondary College. So thanks for coming along um, to listen to Tara Anglican School for Girls. Um, today, you'll get to see all the hard work and dedication that they've put into their World Parks Congress Fuse project. So I'm now going to hand over to Dan Nichols, who is running the project, and he's going to explain to you, he's from the National Parks and Wildlife Service, he's going to explain to you what the project is all about, and then we're going to hand over to the students of Tara Anglican School for Girls, and they're going to do a presentation, and then we'll see their love story video. So please, um, big welcome to Tara and Dan. Thank you, Danielle, and, and good morning, everyone. Uh, FUSE is a program developed by New South Wales National Parks and Wildlife Service to link secondary schools to a globally significant conservation event happening here in Sydney in three weeks' time. The World Parks Congress is held just once every 10 years. It's organised by the IUCN, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, uh, the Congress will see conservation ag agencies like New South Wales National Parks and, and others from all over the world, uh, park managers, rangers, research scientists, coming together to debate and discuss all those issues about conservation uh, and setting the agenda for protected areas and conservation for the next 10 years until the next Congress. In line with the inspiring and new generation stream of this year's Congress, uh, which has aims of including the voice of young people at the Congress. Uh, this program, WPC Fuse, was established to link New South Wales secondary schools uh, to the Congress and to challenge these schools to investigate and report on issues that will be discussed and deb debated at the Congress and to bring us here and at the World Parks Congress uh, their inspiring solutions to those challenges. They're doing great so far. Um, Stream five of the Congress is reconciling development challenges. One of the objectives of marine parks is to conserve biological diversity through a system of protected areas in all our coastal bioregions. Multi-use parks, uh, marine parks, use zones to regulate the different uses or um, resource gathering that can occur within marine parks, with the most ecologically important zones being included in sanctuary areas. Students from Tara Anglican School for Girls have been investigating the various types of marine parks in New South Wales. They have explored progress in Australia towards conservation targets set under the, conserva um, the Conservation Convention sorry, on Biological Diversity. They are working on how to raise community awareness and support for the role of marine parks uh, and how to balance the conservation and exploitation or use of, the, of vital marine resources. Uh, it's a pleasure to introduce Annika, Charlotte, Lauren and Sarah to detail their research uh, and to introduce their inspiring solution and their love story video. Give them a round of applause, please. Did you know that New South Wales has a fish emblem? Hopefully by the end of this presentation, you will know what it is. Our aims in this research project that we conducted as part of the WPC FUSE program um, can be seen just next to me. As we began to do some preliminary research into answering these aims, we began to find out how little we knew about marine parks and how complicated marine protection is. It became apparent that these aims were slightly too ambitious for students, so we narrowed them down into four focus questions that we began to answer with secondary research. These questions were, what types of marine protected areas are there? Where are they? Who governs them? And what is their purpose? Firstly, what are marine protected areas? There are different types of protected areas, the main two of which are marine parks and aquatic reserves. Marine parks are large areas of ocean managed in a way to benefit society and nature, 
as well as to improve and maintain biodiversity. Aquatic reserves are protected areas with the primary objective of conservation, particularly for the biodiversity of marine life. Some reserves have more holistic aims regarding the protection of the ecosystem as a whole, such as Cabbage Tree Bay with a small coastal bay ecosystem. There are four main zones found within marine protected areas, specifically in marine parks. Zoning occurs to allow the area to be used by the public while still maintaining, while still protecting the marine life and the environment. A general use zone offers the least protection and acts as a buffer zone to the rest of the marine park. There are other stages of protection which link to the highest level of protection, which is a sanctuary zone. This zone allows most recreational activities, except those that harm or take plants or animals, making it a no-take zone. Secondly, we investigated where marine, where marine protected areas are. As you can see, they are found in every state of, of Australia, as well as our external territories, such as Macquarie Island. The protection of the Queensland coast over here is very large, while in comparison, the New South Wales um, state waters have very little marine area protected, especially in the Sydney region, which is highly populated. Some marine protected areas are better known than others. For example, the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park in Queensland and Shark Bay Marine Park in Western Australia. These are two examples of World Heritage Sites as well highlighting the importance of the marine environment to the world. In New South Wales, there are six marine parks and 12 aquatic reserves, whose area covers nearly a third of state waters, with 7% of the coast in sanctuary zones. One aquatic reserve in Sydney is Cabbage Tree Bay, which is where our primary research was conducted. We will explain this further later on. Thirdly, we conducted secondary research into who is responsible for the upkeep zoning and regulation of activities in marine protected areas. We discovered that this is an extremely complicated part of marine protection with many stakeholders involved. The organisation of governance of marine protected areas is currently under review by the New South Wales Government who are in highest command. Next to me is a simplified chart to show, who, um, to show how all the various stakeholders connect, especially to the Minister for Primary Industries and the Minister for Environment. I will now hand over to my peer, Lauren, who will finish off our focus questions by explaining the purpose of marine protected areas to us. So what, are, um, what is the purpose of marine protected areas? Marine protected areas provide benefits economically, socially and environmentally. In researching these benefits, my team focused on the last point. Um, marine protected areas provide for research and training and allow us to monitor the environmental effect of human activities. This led us to the discovery of boffs, big old fat fecund female fish. Fishing is one human activity which directly impacts boffs. But why do we need to protect them? Well, if you've ever had to throw a fish back because it was below the legal size, you are familiar with a principle that guides many recreational and commercial fisheries. This law allows fish to reach maturity before capture in the hope that it would improve the overall fish population. However, the discovery of boffs contradicts this belief, with recent research showing that one of the best ways to ensure long-term successful reproduction and replenishment of the fish stocks is to protect the larger, healthier female breeders. A study done by the ICES Journal of Marine Science concluded that catching one big old fat fecund female can be just as damaging to the fish population's reproductive potential as catching four young ones. But how do we protect these fish? Well, the Fisheries for Conservations believe that these, oops, believe that these are two of the major ways to protect boffs to ensure a healthier future for generations of fish stocks. They believe marine protected areas is one way to guarantee the second of the two points. Setting aside some areas where there is no fishing allowed will enable the boff to breed in peace, ensuring stock stability and replenishment. However, not everyone is happy with this outcome. One of the largest issues perceived by people is that marine protected areas are destroying our commercial fishing industry. However, a recent study actually found that communities that act locally to limit fish catches reaped commercial benefits by ensuring ongoing stock. This issue has been a heated debate for years, with fisheries all over New South Wales feeling threatened, particularly by the government's decision to allow no-take zones within some of these areas. 
The Australian Research Council Centre conducted a recent research which suggests that the use of small marine protected areas to protect critical areas has significant local benefits. According to Professor Tom Compass, in the journal Solutions he wrote earlier this year, um, reserves generate a resilience effect. They act as buffer stocks where a negative shock to a fishery can be compensated for by spillover effects in fish stocks from a nearby no-take area. This buffer stock effect can be substantial, leading not only to higher catches over time, but both quicker return to profitability and higher sustainable profits. This discovery can greatly boost Australia's fishing industries and has significant benefits on an international scale. Through embracing the benefits of marine protected areas, the Australian fishing industry is provided with a marketing advantage over competitors and an insurance policy against threats such as rising fuel costs and stock depletion. Another study conducted by researcher Michael Heyman concluded that marine protected areas are not in conflict with commercial fishing but can be complementary and sustainable fisheries stand to benefit. The studies also show the economic, reputational and ecosystem benefits offered by these marine protected areas. Point one is talking about how sustainable certification can improve profit margins for industries that specialise in high quality sustainable seafood, avoiding competition with inferior products that rely on low wages, fuel subsidies and short term overfishing. Point two refers to spillovers from no take zones, allowing fish from these areas to increase stock populations. This potentially benefits commercial fisheries by increasing the amount of fish caught from the same level of effort, enabling harvests of larger and more highly valued fish. Lastly, point three talks about how marine protected areas can increase the diversity and density of marine species, improving the overall health and resilience of marine ecosystems. This allows for larger, more stable populations of commercial fish stocks. In conclusion, marine protected areas can increase fishery margins in the short term and ensure fish stocks for the long term. The second stage of our investigation was to conduct our primary research. To find out more about marine protected areas, to find out more about marine protected areas. So on Saturday the 14th of September, our Year 9 Geography elective class and I went to Cabbage Tree Bay where we snorkeled in the aquatic reserve and were able to gather underwater footage of the biodiversity located there. I would just like to acknowledge the generosity of Lands Edge who provided us with the snorkeling equipment. The rich diversity of marine life and prolific growth of seagrass and kelp was in stark contrast to our previous observations made at Chowder Bay and Balmoral Bay earlier in the year. At Chowder Bay, fishing is allowed and as a result there is little marine life and virtually no kelp. At Balmoral Bay, fishing is banned, however due to other recreational activities, fishing kelp numbers are still low. Cabbage Tree Bay, however, is an aquatic reserve and the results of this were immediately evident. From the footage collected in Cabbage Tree Bay, we were able to observe firsthand the marine life that exists within the protected area and were able to see some of the species that are threatened, including the Port Jackson shark, common stingray, three-bar porcupine fish and the blue groper. The next part of our primary research was to conduct a survey of the general public to ascertain how well informed the general public are about marine protected areas. I will now hand over to Charlotte Wheeler who will present our findings. The next thing was to find out what the general public knew. So we created a multiple choice survey addressing the basics about marine parks. We ran the survey over the course of seven weeks, within which time 457 surveys were completed. As we can see in question one, the majority of people knew the three correct answers, although almost 25% of the population thought that marine parks were there to protect the coast from storm damage, which is incorrect. Then, we questioned what percentage of New South Wales' New South Wales' coast was marine parks, and from the even spread of answers, we can conclude that most people guessed. The correct answer was 7%. In question three, we asked people which types of fish it was important to throw back and not keep while fishing. And the majority of people said that all young fish, when in fact it is better to throw back the old female fish, as they are very fertile and make stronger, healthier little fish, whereas the little fish are more in danger of being eaten and they produce less strong eggs. Question four was to produce what, no, question four was to see what the public knew about sanctuary zones. Many people thought that you could only conduct scientific research in these zones, when in reality you can do everything except fish. 
how do we know where, where marine parks are was our next question, and the correct answer to this was on maps and GPS devices when a significant amount thought that there would be signs out on the water telling them when they were entering a marine park area. Over the past few weeks, my team has concluded from our primary research that the best way to protect these areas is to first make their presence known to the public, particularly the youth, as they are the ones directly impacted by the choices we make today. The way in which we believe awareness can be raised is dealt with in our video presentation. I will now hand over to Annika, who will present the conclusion of our research. From our research, we then drew conclusions into what must be done as a result of what we found. Firstly, it is important to recognise and to teach others the importance of marine protected areas to the oceans and marine biodiversity. There are many economic benefits to marine protected areas, particularly for the sustainability of the fishing industry and to maintain the generation of natural resources such as oil. The effect that marine parks have on the improvement of fish populations is key to these economic benefits. There are vital social implications of marine protected areas as over 80% of the Australian population lives within 15 kilometres of the coast. As more people move to the coast, it is vital that we maintain the ocean for leisure activities that do not harm or take marine life and vegetation. Despite the significant percent of the Australian population living on the coast, there is very limited knowledge regarding marine protection and the marine environment on the whole. There are many environmental benefits for the marine environment particularly for biodiversity as a result of marine protected areas. This is significant as it is vital that we maintain the marine environment in a way that will preserve it for the generations to come so that they can enjoy it for the best it can be. In conclusion, marine protected areas are vitally important to the economy for the public to enjoy the marine environment and also to maintain and improve biodiversity. Following our research, we decided that the best action we could take was to raise awareness in schools and start educating our generation. Our aim is to challenge students in New South Wales to learn more about the marine environment. Our idea for this was to create a blue wave to raise awareness of the marine environment. We want you to create a blue wave during Sea Week, which is the first week in March, to raise awareness and to educate your school population. Our video shows you some of the ways that you can make a blue wave. It might be a wave in water, a Mexican wave, or a hand wave. Be as creative as you can be to create your own blue wave. Upload your blue wave onto social media, such as Instagram, Facebook, or Twitter, and challenge others to create a unique blue wave as we raise awareness in the youth of our population. Once you have raised awareness, then educate people. It could be a snorkeling field trip, posters around your school, a guest speaker in assembly, anything that will increase the knowledge and understanding of marine environments. We hope our video will inspire you to make a difference. Thank you. 
Wow, wonderful girls. That was um, certainly an interesting and exciting topic. You chose a good one there where you get to actually go out and do some snorkeling. I love it. Um, what we're going to do now is have a, um, have a discussion time um, with the girls from Tara and we're also going to have some question time too. So I'll hand over to Dan for, um, for a bit of a discussion and then we'll go to questions. Thanks, Danielle. Just a couple of things. The groper in the video, you that's your footage? Fantastic work, guys. Um, which does bring us to fish. One of the things we asked you to do in this project was to produce a love story, and well done. I think it really is engaging, um, to help connect people to conservation stories. And, and then we asked you to tell a love story about fish. How, di how did you go with that? How did you approach it, I guess? How do you start to... Was it difficult to, to get your, I mean, often we don't think about fish in the same way we think of about colourful birds or cute mammals. So an interesting challenge or how did you go? Yeah, one of the things that we um, thought about the first time that we started thinking about how to um, make people love fish was just how hard it is to love scaly things. Um, no one really likes spiders or snakes or fish, um, but we love the cute floppy things like tigers and um, those kind of things because they've got really cute little kids. Um, but Nemo is kind of the closest that you get to a cute fish. Um, so we figured that we've got to find something that you can really connect to. And that's when we found out about the New South Wales fish emblem. Um, and we decided to go with that because um, that's where we can form a patriotic love for fish um, through this emblem that represents the people of New South Wales. Yeah. Great solution. Well done, guys. Um, in the film, you mentioned uh, some of the ways of, of focusing people's attention during Sea Week and starting to tell stories um, or to help people learn about the value of marine protected areas, um, focusing on biodiversity or, or reducing pollution. Um, if we asked you to choose a key one for next year's, a key message, what would you, how would you like, what would you suggest we focus on? Anyone got an idea? Fox is probably the one that I, because it was really interesting stuff as well. Um, we might see if we've got some questions um, from Danielle. I hope that our inspiring solution will like, raise awareness in the population and spread nationwide, and we want everyone getting involved in this. I, I like the fact that it's a week every year, it repeats, so um, yeah, it's something that can grow. It's, it's a nice uh, approach to it. <laughs> See, no one was snoozing, were they? <laughs> Another question from the audience? Are marine protected areas and catch limits the best way to conserve fish populations for the future? What additional protections would you put in place? Um, an additional protection that we would put in place is to have um, a maximum and a minimum um, for fish being caught. Um, we already have the minimum, but we think that having the maximum um, would prevent um, important fish like boffs from also being caught, yes. Yeah, yeah sure. Um, you said one of the ways that you could get your um, the protected areas more well known is through the signs to show people what's actually out there. How can you guarantee that people will actually listen to the signs? Um, that's a really good question because um, it's really hard to know how the public are going to respond to new measures like signs on the water. 
Um, and so I guess then it's an element of trust with the public and also educating them to teach them the importance of the marine environment and why it's so important that they follow um, these regulations regarding um, marine protected areas and how important they are to maintaining a healthy ecosystem within the marine environment. Just on, on your research, you asked people if, to estimate how much of New South Wales marine areas were protected. Um, was, and 7% is the, is the actual amount. Uh, what, were, what were most people think, what did most people think it was roughly? Most people thought that there was 15 to 20 percent of, yeah. Which is, is sort of the area of terrestrial protected areas are, around there, but um, not um, marine protected areas. Okay, we've got one more question yeah. from the audience. Down here. From Cherry Brook Technology High School. Um, what was the most significant thing you gained from your discussions with your mentors? Ian Southers and Steve Smith, um, technical information or inspirational guidance? Um, from the discussions with our mentors, we learned a lot about studying marine environments and like protected areas and all that. Yeah. Yeah, just another one. Um, with your blue wave challenge, how do you plan to like s spread this challenge, as you said, across the nation? Okay. Um, we were we're planning to um, the majority of it to be during Sea Week, which is the first week of March. Um, but apart from that, spreading it around was mainly going to be done through social media because everyone has social media. Which is, I guess, one of the, the stream we're looking at is reconciling development challenges. And this is really one of the key ones where lots of people who are, who are engaged in using the resource are vocal about the protection, about the, the availability, the access to it. Uh, where in other sort of conservation stories, say, like old growth forest, we talk about that, lots of people become interested, uh, and even if they never visit an old growth forest, they're invested in, and they understand the value of that protection. And I suppose this, the idea of this is to get people to understand that even if they don't use the resource, there's value in protecting it. So someone just, just help. If you want to share um, the Blue Week challenge on social media, is there a certain hashtag that should be used? Um, Blue Wave challenge? Oh, yeah. Okay, any more questions from the audience? I love your uh, work, girls. It's fantastic research you've done there. I'm just interested. I was really impressed with your uh, your ac acronym of your uh, your boffs. And, and as a fisherman, uh, I think one of the issues uh, some of us might have is telling the difference between a male and a female fish. And if you if you want people to sort of throw those big old fat fecund females back, that's a great idea. But I think maybe you know, another suggestion would be maybe in the education of people in, in the difference between a female and a male fish in regards to the, some species. I know with birds they're certainly different. I don't know if it's the same for fish and, and maybe the National Parks uh, gentleman up there can tell us. But uh, that's certainly something you could sort of um, work towards in the future. That would be, you know, you, you mentioned the question, what could you do in the future? That would be something you could extend it. Uh, but that's certainly uh, something you could look towards. Thanks. Yes. Uh, yeah, um, a great story to hang, you know, to, to set around Sea Week in, in, in next year or years ahead is some of that identification, I guess. Okay, another question down here. Um, girls, really impressed with what you did today. Super hard topic that you've done, so very proud of you. Not knowing you, but uh, amazing. Um, I just wanted to 
get from you. What did you get the most out of doing this kind of a project? Because that was really hard and you've done such a great job. What did you get out of it? Um, I think something that, like, personally I've really learnt is just how much information there is out there about our environment that we aren't aware of, um, because we're so stuck in what we need to know for our next exam that we forget how much more there is to topics that we learn about. And so it's really challenged me, um, especially in my studies, to go beyond um, just what we need to know for the exam and especially look into more wider ranges of um, interests and learn more about things because we don't take the time to learn about our environment that we really should. Great. Thanks very much, everyone. Let's have a big round of applause for these guys. Okay, so just to wrap it up, I'd like to um, thank Charlotte, Sarah, Annika and Lauren for their amazing presentation. Well done, girls. Really, really inspiring. Um, so for more information on, um, on these projects, you can go to the National Parks and Wildlife website. So thank you for being with us today and enjoy the rest of the 2014 Youth Eco Summit.